finally getting back to me, you know, my art. All I want to do is art. And the other thing is that I love stories. So like to me, art isn't everything. You, your art is your voice, your speaking, your connection. You know, you can, you can feel everyone's energy. That's your art. It's the art of living to me. So art and hustle to me is the art of living and art of it and everything. Oh, I hope that you've cut that piece right there and make it your intro and your outro because that was dope. Started. I'm ready. All I'm right. nervous. I'm okay. nervous. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to uh, thank you for the opportunity for me to interview you because I know uh, you've done an amazing job putting together this Art and Hustle program. And in a way, it's kind of a, a nostalgia flashback to our lives and to where we all came from and to how well uh, so many of us are, um, well, not me, but I'm saying in general, people doing so great. And for you to open up that vehicle, I think it's phenomenal. And I thought that since you're interviewing all these people, you know, I want to know, and I think the people have the right to know the, the Linda Chum story. I mean, I think that's yeah. what we, we need to know. We need to find out. And hopefully, uh, you know, with my prepared questions, I don't know how much we'll get out of that, but mm -hmm. um, I think we would like to hear that because I feel you do such a great job interviewing everybody else. So mm -hmm. why not we get to a little bit about Linda? So I have like these different categories of the okay. interview, so we okay. don't have to follow it. It's not so serious, but at the same time, <laughs> Uh, you know, if we can get there, that'd be great. Uh, if not, no worries. So, uh, All right. Well, I just it. want to thank you for um, being part of this and turning the tables and uh, doing this with me because I think it's um, amazing that you're coming on board and supporting uh, the vision that I have. Well, I've always, you know, always been a big fan of yours. You know that. I mean, ever since, uh, you know, read days and, uh, you know, I've been following uh, these interviews that you've been doing and seeing all the different people doing such wonderful, successful things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just wanted that opportunity to say, you know what, let's see, let's see Linda's side. Let's flip it. So, uh, <laughs> let's I, find let's out get... a little bit about Linda's story. Yes. Here we go. Let, let's rock and roll because there's going to be some things that I'm going to learn along the way that I might not have learned. So I'm yeah. excited about that. And uh, yeah. if a question ever feels too, you know, personal or whatever, then we just keep mm -hmm. it moving. But I think it's important yeah. for our viewers or your viewers to, to get the true side of who you really are. Exactly. So, all right, exactly. so let's get started. So, you know, tell me where you were born. Like, you know, obviously the day you were born, I always get confused. I, I know it's now uh, March 27th, right? No, yeah, March okay. 28th. Yeah, right. so, March 28th. And uh, so and where were you born and how did you kind of end up like coming out to Central Iceland? So I was born in China. So I was born in uh, Fuzhou, China. And uh, yeah, I never knew that. Small... You were born in China. That's... I was born in China. So I was made in China. I came here when I was three years old. And um, Fuzhou is like a small little province. Um, it's southern China near Taiwan. And uh, yeah, I was actually made in China. <laughs> I never, I know. And how, how old were you when you, um, I mean, as far as your family is concerned, when did they decide to come to the United States? I came here when I was three years old. So my grandfather actually, I think he had some pull in possibly the military or the political system. And so he was actually able to get um, five of his kids over and their family over here. So my dad and his family was like four brothers and one sister. So the entire family was able to come with their kids. Wow. Holy cow. So there's actually a village in China called the Chung Village. Do you have any desire at all to take your children or to go back? Have you been back since? I, I actually have been back to there at least um, three to four times already. Really? Because two times I went when I was younger, I had to go for my grandmother's funeral. So those were all when I was uh, pretty young. And um, the, one, of the, one of the major pivotal, pivotal times that I did go back was um, when I was actually working in the fashion industry and I actually went back to the factory that was making my design for Walmart. So I saw an entire factory making my garments and I was actually able to go back to my hometown again, but in much more like uh, technology advanced, the roads were better because before it was strictly like stone streets, barely any lights, no like running hot water. It was like a real village back in the days when I went as a kid. So it was nice to see it um, evolve. Now, when you saw your product being made, was it more, did it disconnect you a little bit from the personal and it made it more, was it more business oriented at that time? It, you know, or was it, it a was, 
it, it was a combination of both. It was really interesting. And I was honored to be able to go back there and see the factory, be able to see all of my stuff in there being produced. So it was interesting. And the factory, they made it, um, they made it, they made sure that they took care of their employees. So that it was a nice factory. It wasn't like a really rundown one or anything like that. Wow. And, and the children know all about this and they've, 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 have you had pictures and you took, you know, and you showed your family this and. I probably spoke about it, but they're getting older now. They might've forgot if I told them. So I'll have to remind them. So that's why these, these uh, podcasts actually are amazing because now it's documented because as I'm getting older, I have terrible memory. <laughs> Well, I, I couldn't help it over here with the Josh Benitez interview that, you know, he was telling you all these stories about these teachers and you're like, yeah, I don't really remember that teacher. He's like, how about this teacher? You're like, no, I don't really remember that teacher either. But then you're going to, you remember vivid points of going back to your yeah. origin, where you're from. I do have little flashes of memory, but a lot of my chunk of childhood was, uh, has disappeared. Why is that? Is that because of how you were um, raised in some situations that happened when you were growing up? Yeah, I grew up in a very violent household and uh, my dad was possibly a manic, depressive, abusive, alcoholic, violent individual who would get really bad when he would drink or, and he was very militant. So it was always his rules. And if you didn't obey them, you would get beaten. And so I don't, I don't know if we've ever spoken about that. We um, talked, you know, we talked briefly about it, but it wasn't something that was, you know, um, it was kind of like an unwritten thing that we kind of, you said it once and I just kind of mm -hmm. let it be, but obviously you were able to channel a lot of that, um, you know, lifestyle and a lot of that anger and frustration into your, who you are into that drive, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've and, channeled it towards my art. So I think that art saved me, that it gave me a voice to be able to express some of the anger and to be able to succeed and move forward in my life. Now, was that most of your childhood that behavior took place in the household? Was it against all the family? Yeah, I think it was. You live with some of the workers, right? In the restaurant that you had, right? So you just kind of split the household. So did yeah. he hide, did he hide some of that behavior in front of the people that were like, or no, or did he, no, um, I, well, he hid half of his behavior, but everyone knew that he was very violent. Um, he even even when we first came here, I think that I was trying to I was trying to figure out why I lost a lot of my memory. And I realized at one point when I came here between three, three years old and going to CI, because originally we came to West Babylon and we lived there for a little bit. We had a restaurant there and then we moved to Central Islip and had a restaurant in Ronkonkoma. But at one point in West Babylon, he tried to kill me. And how old were so, you at that time? You must have been what? Yeah, so like this scar, you can't see it in the light here because the light's blowing out. So I have a scar on my head here. So I think it had to have been between three to five around that age that he tried to kill me. So did you know I, he was he was trying to? He said he was doing, it, or you just felt at the time um, he was defenseless. I vividly remember him wow. trying to kill me. So well, how does because of the culture, because of the um, the, the different types of uh, intimidation, maybe by the rules and regulations society, not knowing, like, how is he not put to the test it, or, or how are the police or authorities not called? Did because, your mom not want to step in or, because I know we'll get into this kind of early, but I think this is important to talk about, you know, what you went through as a child and it's obviously evolved you to who you are now. Well, I think that as immigrants, coming from a family of immigrants, my mom didn't really speak very good English and my dad, um, they were all kind of like sheltered in this like immigrant world where you don't ever speak about anything in your household. You never talk about it. Anything that's happening in the household, anything that's happening between your marriage or whatever, you just don't speak about it. You just hide it. Everything was a secret. You always hide everything. You don't talk about any of it. And you would never talk about any of these things. It just was like an unspoken rule of to not talk about it because really if you spoke about it you would either get beaten or possibly get killed. isolated that we had no tools and no knowledge of how to get out of it it was kind of like you were in a prison and you just did not know how to get out so did this con continue for how many did this continue all throughout your childhood or did he start um, slowing up when you became older? Like, well, what, it probably know. stopped, um, probably my freshman, freshman, no, sophomore. I think it stopped around sophomore year. Sophomore year of high school. 
Mm -hmm. Wow. So that's a, that's a long time. So I appreciate you yeah. sharing that. I mean, I know it's, um, it's important as have you've done in your interviews to, to have your guests be as authentic as possible and be as yes. real as possible. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's definitely a big part of who you are, but that, that's gotta be tough to, to channel all that and, and all that frustration and rage um, that was brought upon you, especially to work for him and mm -hmm. put on this face. Cause when, when I knew you at the restaurant or just at school, like you would never, you know, how would you know? You know what I mean? You would like never you just, know. You would, you you would never, never know. know. You know, you just like the yep. family that worked in the restaurant and provided and, you know, and, uh, you know, obviously every family has their, their situations, but you never thought it'd be something of, of that caliber. Who would? Yeah. Know? Yeah. I feel like it's something that I'm slowly unpacking now as I get older, because right now I'm 46 and I feel like I need to eventually write my book and tell my story because hopefully me telling my story will help somebody else. Is he still alive? Is he still alive? I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, he's still alive. And you guys don't communicate at all? No, I was finally able to end that communication after my mom died. Yeah, sorry about that. Isn't that, it's just ironic, right? I like that, uh, that all unravels. So, but you know what? I mean, um, obviously it's about you and, but learning through all the different trials and tribulations that a lot of us have gone through, um, it pretty much, I don't know, makes us who we are, but you know, that's, even, I couldn't even uh, comprehend. So, yeah. uh, but thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Let's, uh, let's switch to a little bit of a, a more of a, a lighter <laughs> topic. So now that you go from West Babylon, mm -hmm. uh, what brought your parents to Central Iceland? Like, how did you get to, how did you come to? I'm not, it? I'm not really sure why they switch restaurants, um, but I think well, so my- the restaurants got there, but it was in Ronkakuma, the second restaurant. Yeah, yeah. The second restaurant was in Ronkakuma and we lived in Central Iceland, so- um, we were constantly commuting back and forth um, to the restaurant to work. Like my after school program was you know, really the restaurant, but obviously I was thankful that I had extracurricular activities that my brother and sister instilled on to me to make sure I do those things and do sports and clubs so I would be able to get into a good college. So. And do you, do you feel like you also got into those to kind of keep busy outside the home environment, outside the restaurant environment to kind of keep you yeah. Um, doing your own and forming your own identity. Yeah, yeah. I Well, I think it was really good that they told me to do those things. One, to get to a good college and to get out of my home. And two, to not want to go home at all. You know, right. like I would try to probably stay after school as much as possible to do something to not go home. But like, what did, when did you know that you had that certain gifts? Like, when did you know you have certain talents for art? When did you know that this is something that I, I might want to continue to pursue at, at that age I, for me. I'm not sure. I feel like I've always drawn as a kid. Like whenever I would have relatives who would go to China and they would ask me, what do I want? I wouldn't be able to speak fully in, in Chinese. Um, so I would draw them pictures. But I remember at the restaurant, I was always drawing dragons and Spider-Man and phoenixes. And I think with the help of the art teachers that supported my vision and my talents that really helped flourish it more is the teachers. Because it take, they always said like, it takes a village to raise someone. So thank God for teachers in CI. Yeah. And I think that you also said throughout your interviews that you started to gravitate towards um, friends that were going through similar or maybe not similar, but, you know, experiences that were somewhat common. We all kind of grew up in the same neighborhood. We all, you know, not many of us, if we had both parents, there were situations, but we all kind of, you know, used each other to kind of build each other up. Yeah. I'm so thankful that our group of friends were um, a mix of all kinds of races and we were pretty tight that we were always there for each other and we'll be able to talk to each other about problems and issues um, so I totally appreciate all of our friends that were there for us yeah I think you know it, it's like life in general you get out what you put in so the more you share in, in certain relationships and, and they share back and then you feel like you're not alone and, and then that yeah. kind of motivates you to continue to yeah. succeed so if you had to look back at you know 16 year old Linda you know, what would you tell her? You know, if you had, if you could, you're 46 now, you had to go back 30 years and, and ask or talk to 16 year old Linda, would you say anything different? Would you tell her, keep it up? Like what, you know, cause obviously she was going through a lot, but she also was on a nice path. You know, what would be mm -hmm. some things you might want to share with her? Um, that everything will be okay. Now you, you switch gear when you, when you, after you graduated CI, mm -hmm. you switch gears and you, uh, you went, you started out in Syracuse for a year, right? Mm -hmm. 
And then you end up going uh, to Parsons. Yeah, that I went there for reason? a year and a half, and then I uh, transferred over to uh, Parsons for fashion design. Okay, and that was the, the sole reason why it wasn't the weather. You weren't, you couldn't hang up uh, there. Well, yeah, the weather sucked. It was super cold. I couldn't handle it. But um, I was originally majoring in surface pattern design because um, coming from immigrant family, your main goal is to make money. So they don't like for me, like my brothers and sister were more academic and, you know, the brainiacs and got the A pluses, honor society and all that. I was the one who was more artistic. So they really didn't have a space for me in Asian culture. You know, it's like, OK, what you want? You like art? Like, what the hell do you do with that? You're you're going to be a starving artist. So I've always heard that my entire life. So my main objective in life was always to be not a starving artist. So it wasn't really to follow my passion of like what type of art I wanted. I just needed to make sure that I made money and succeeded in my, you know, not to be a starving artist. So yeah. that's what happened when I was choosing a career was like, which one will give me a job? So originally in Syracuse, they had like a 99% placement for surface pattern design. And that's basically um drawing flowers and painting flowers with the triple zero brush and just sitting there drawing flowers and repeats and wallpapers and I had like a meltdown one night where I was like dying paper and I paint I dyed this paper five times and eventually um I had the color that I wanted and I spilled my entire paint all over my paper and that was the night I was like you know what I quit <laughs> yeah it <laughs> was, like, was a feel yeah, I was like, I can't keep doing this the rest of my life. And I think I spoke to my brother, like, what other careers can I do in art? And he said, well, fashion design, that makes a lot of money. So do fashion. Like, it's always about prestige and, um, like, honor and, like, you know, making money. So fashion was the next route. And I, Miss Winograd had actually taken me to um, Parsons to see the senior show. So I was blown away by it. So that's why I was like, well... If I'm gonna go anywhere, I'll go to Parsons. And you and you did three three years there. I did three years there, and I was able to get three of my garments into a senior fashion show because usually only allowed one. Oh, that's great. So I was able to get three of them in there. Now, where did you work after that? I know you worked for a while. I, I know yeah. COVID. I know you'll get it. We'll get into it. I know COVID yeah. hit you pretty hard. So and, right, and a, right after right after um, Parsons, I had two job offers. One was into menswear or children's wear. So I decided, okay, well, I guess I'll do children's wear because that'll be more creative and more fun. And um, then I never left children's wear. <laughs> so from 1999 to 2020, I was doing uh, licensed products for like Disney, Nickelodeon, Marvel, doing like sportswear, baby clothes, uh, Calvin Klein jeans girls, Hillary Duff. And I did a little bit of women's um, pajamas, men's pajamas. You would design the pajamas or they would give you the design and you had to put the art? I would, so I'm basically designing the all the garments. Wow. Yeah. But you so can't, I, are you allowed to put, obviously I'm not knowledgeable about, do you have to, can you put your name on the label or it has to no, be their name? They no, cut the check. To, it has to be uh, the company label. So all the labels are all uh, given to me because it's all licensed. So you would never know it, I did it. And um, yeah, you, you have to go within the guidelines of it because it's children's wear. So there's a lot of rules and regulations like bows can only be a certain size. You can't have things like falling off. So kids don't choke on them, especially for sleepwear is like fire retardant um so it's there's a lot of rules okay um and you started finding a niche with that for a while for a long time yeah that was uh, like it, what 23 years i was doing that and did you ever feel you know trapped in certain respects creative always creative wise so always because if you had an idea <laughs> obviously it's you know if you're working with these big companies they're like yeah that's yeah. great but what are you going to do yeah you? yeah so it's, it's so once again it's kind of connected i'm sorry to interrupt but it's kind of connected somewhat maybe to being trying to fit this image of, of a monster type figure telling you how to do things once yeah. again challenging your own yeah, creativity yeah. in certain respects. Yeah, it, it, it coincides because you have, I'm working for these, first it's like smaller uh, companies and then it goes into, you know, larger corporate companies and um, you're basically designing to, to sell, that's it. You, your main objective is to sell and make lots of money for the company. And it, it came to a point where it, like, it was never enough. Like even though our company made and 
kept the whole company afloat. It was just never enough. Like we never made enough, even though we made millions and millions of dollars and every single child probably owned one of our pajamas. Wow. Yeah. That's, and meanwhile, we'll never know. Yeah, like our pajamas were, our, our pajamas were the monopoly of the entire like United States everywhere. Wow. It was everywhere. It's like in Walmart, Target, Kohl's, um, every mass market it would be at, even Amazon, every, it's everywhere. So as an artist, do you feel that it is a, quote, I don't know if it's, it's like the catch 22, right? So if you, you, if you make it, you know, then you're not a true, you know, uh, you know, the artist has to be struggling. The artist can't really make anything in the beginning. Like they have to show that they're, but then if you really make it, then you're too commercial. You kind of sold out to the corporate. Mm -hmm. uh, did you ever find yourself in that kind of, you know, weird situation or not, not at all? Um, I really wasn't too worried about it because my main objective was to make sure that I was able to pay my bills, um, be able to be self-sufficient. So I wasn't worried about selling out and all that stuff. I just need to make sure I was able to take care of myself, pay my bills, um, just not go back home, <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, so right. I had to make sure that whatever job I had would be able to pay all the bills that I needed. So I was always working a nine to five, but I always had a side business all the time. Cause I felt like the nine to five was just to pay the bills and my side hustles would feed my soul. Good, good. And then did you ever share this back with your mom and share it back, you know, at times with your father and say, hey, listen, this, I'm, I'm proving to you that art is making me money. Art is giving me a lifestyle. I did, I did. I think as I got older, um, I was doing like many side businesses. So I was doing like card business for a while and then I was doing other stuff. So at one point I did get that approval from them later on where they would help me with my side hustles and they would see what I was doing. And they're like, wow, Linda, you're doing really great. Like you are doing amazing. So I did get that nod of approval from them, you know? Good. So Change is always the great thing, right? So tell us about your kids, tell us about Obviously, uh, you know, Madison first, tell us a little bit about some of the greatest things about her and, and what, you know, what do you love about your children so much? And Well, my kids are great. Uh, Madison is going to be 13 on Saturday. So she's- super... How could that happen? You're not old enough to have a 13 year old. She's going to be 13 and she's super, super excited. And the funny thing with her lately is that she did a whole slide presentation to convince me to get nail tips. <laughs> Like a whole presentation, the pros and why and the reasons and photo, like it was really like professionally done. That I was, was she like, standing in front of a, a wall with a screen or was she no, doing just her like laptop? This? Just her laptop. Oh, just sitting at the laptop. Okay. All yeah, right. So Good. She did the whole presentation on the laptop. It was kind of like a power. It looked like a PowerPoint like presentation, and I was like, "Wow, this is a really good presentation." And what so, was the verdict? I, well, I said yes, because I already knew that these things were coming because my sister's um, daughter is the same age as Maddie and she's already done things that Maddie hasn't done. So like, she's already gotten her hair dyed. She's already gotten her nails done. So I knew those things were coming down the line. So. Does she have the phone yet already? They, they both had phones because I just, I mean, it's crazy to me that kids have iPhones when, I mean, look back in the days, like it took us forever to have a phone, right? I don't even know when we had phones. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I just, yeah, that's, it's so, thir yeah, that's, uh, that's, so 13, she's doing great. Uh, what are some similarities and differences between the two children that you have? You see, um, like, what, like, what characteristics yeah. of you are in either one? So the funny thing with Maddie is that she's kind of very creative and entrepreneur. So she's always starting businesses. So I'm very, very like supportive of like, hey, you have an idea, let's start it. So when she was little, she started a slime business. And then eventually uh, she started stuff making is the worst. <laughs> My daughter's all over the place. That is, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. But that's great though. That's but, great. But she was selling them. So that was awesome. So she was selling slime. She sold bracelets. And now I think she's doing like selling um scrunchies so i'm really happy that she came out of her shell and is is self-sufficient and confident in her own self is, um he's very creative also he's very artistic he likes to draw they both like to draw and um he is um i feel like he's a very empath, empath too like i feel like he can feel people's feelings and um energy as well right. so now is it do you feel that it's more that you know because obviously you, you're an artist they're around it all the time or do you feel like that's just something that they wanted to do on their own um, or is it something that, you know, that you led them to or the combination? Of I, 
Well, I was always drawing, so I always like supported it. So I never pushed it. So I'm definitely the opposite of a tiger mom. So I just let them uh, have a free reign of like whatever creativity you want to do. I support it. So I never really pushed it. So I was actually surprised that um, they really like doing the art and they continue to do it. What do you think they'll, well, when they get older, let's say 10 years from now, like, how do you think they'll describe, you know, their mom? Like, what do you think? What are some things they'll say? Um, I would hope that they describe me as a strong entrepreneur, artistic, self-sufficient, loving, caring, helpful Fair. individual. Awesome. Especially in this past. So tell us, just to backtrack a little bit. So you... COVID, you know, when you called me, um, you know, when we talked a little bit, you know, during COVID uh, about the mass and about how to reach out to the teachers and try to get you, the, and I was trying to get to many people to help you, like, how big of a hit was that for you? I mean, because you really, it really shook up your whole, turned it all upside down. Yeah. You get, you get into that a little bit, like, you know, where were you when you first heard the news, what was happening? How did you adjust? Like, you know, obviously yeah. transitioning from a divorce, you got a lot of storm coming at you at once. Yeah, it, there was a lot of things happening. I mean, like from my mom passing away to having divorce and then being a single mom. So I always had my nine to five, but I also had like a, like at least three extra side jobs as well to make ends meet. And um, I was at my job for like almost 14 years when they let me go March of 2020. And I was completely devastated because I've, I'm such a workaholic that I've given my all into wherever I am. So I was completely devastated that they let me go. And I was in mourning. I didn't, I didn't know what to do with myself. I'm like, what do I do? I think I took a couple of months to sit in that sadness for a while. And then eventually everyone's like, you, you need to make some masks. And I was like, really? I was like, well, no one's gonna really gonna buy my mask because everyone's buying it from other people. So I was like, no one's gonna buy it from me. Why would I do it? And- Well, why like, self-doubt though? Why self-doubt? You could do it. You know, you could do it. I, why, I why have I that self-doubt at that time? I don't know. I just thought that it's such a, that, cause I felt like I saw it out in the, um, in social media a lot already. So I felt like other people were making them. So I just didn't think that if other people were making it, why would people want need it from me? Okay. And, and, um, and sewing's a lot, it's a lot of work. So I really wasn't like super excited to jump into sewing world because it's really time consuming. And but, do you feel uh, like, because, you know, where we're from growing up and I think a lot of us, you know, lower income, middle income, you hear the different stories, you know, a lot of us tend to identify with who we are by our work. Yeah. And our work is also our tremendous escape. And you so nice, you know, nice sharing about your you know, tough child life. And that's an escape for you. Everything's an escape. Yeah. Right? And but to have it's that, all a survival mode. Right. And to have that pulled out from under you, it's almost like you felt lost. Mm -hmm. That your identity was kind of and then yeah. here's people saying, well, why don't you just make masks? You're like, well, no, that making masks was my side hustle. I could do that if I want to. Like you felt kind of lost out there. And so what, yeah. what kind of got you recentered back to finding Linda again? Or did um, you need to kind of be lost again to, to resurface? I think I had to be lost for a while. Um, what really started pulling it together and finding myself was that, so I did masks for about a year. So thank God, I appreciate you for buying them and supporting my mask. And I thank everybody for supporting me. So that, wow, that was, was, so I was making great. masks for like an entire year. So thank God for that because I was getting orders like every single day. So it was a huge sweatshop in my house. So I'm super, super thankful for that and grateful. After, Did you get into the zone at all? Like a little glass of wine, some music? Were you going like behind the yeah, back of the sewing yeah. machine? Like, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, like my entire kitchen and living room with the, just like fabric everywhere. So right. it was crazy. Right. Um, after that year, I had to figure out, because, you know, now the masks are slowing down. Not, people don't need them as much. So I had to figure out what my next step is. Would I go back to fashion? Would I go back to my safety net of my skills? I've been doing that for 23 years. Do I go back to that? Or do I try to find what I really want to do and what would really make me happy? And so um, life and fate would have it that um, me and my partner went to Atlanta and stayed in an Airbnb there. And it was so beautifully curated that I was so inspired. And I said to him, listen, I think I want to turn the extra room in my house, which was an art studio and office, um, into an Airbnb. 
and I had the vision in, in it and I just did it in like a month or two. I had designed it, bought everything, painted the whole thing. And it, it just turned out really well. The energy of it was beautiful. And the first week that I opened up the doors for it was like June of last year, 2020. I put it online, I added all the photos and it was instantly starting to book up. Wow. Instantly. So it now was it's already- to put it together. It's wanting to kind of have the vision. It's a wanting to actually, but then once you start seeing people signing up for yes. it, were you nervous at all about having yeah. people living in your house that you have yeah. no idea? Well, up? I was completely nervous because as soon as I got a divorce, everybody was against me renting out this you, young, you still have young children. You know what I mean? Yeah. Young children, so, right. so technically everybody was against me renting this room out. So I never rented it out because I also was afraid to have anybody in my house because there's only one door that's separating the Airbnb from my house. So, or me renting it out and somebody else. So I was always super fearful of that as well. So I never rented it out. And I was always afraid of like a squatter being there and not paying. Right. So I, I just decided, okay, my kids are little, I would rather just work 10 jobs and not rent it out. But after I saw that Airbnb in Atlanta, I was like, wow, this is beautiful. I think, uh, I think it's time. The kids are getting older and I'm getting exhausted. <laughs> so once again, it goes to the principle of the, you know, growing up the side hustle, trying to find a way you get put into one room, then the window doesn't open. You yeah. got to find a way to get out and come up with yeah. something else creative. So the Airbnb yeah. kind of got you back on your feet. Yeah. So the, after I started the Airbnb, the funny story with that is that the week that I started the Airbnb, put it online, it was live and active. My j old company job actually offered my old job back to me. Really? Yeah. But with a lower pay. Well, yeah. So what you, obviously you told them, you know. So yeah, I was like in that crossroad of like, okay, do I go back to safety? And, you know, I get everything, I get a paycheck, everything's good. Or do I um, jump and take the risk and put all the cards and risk it all for myself? So I had to like really, and I'm, a, I'm super like, I'm always, I'm always thinking safety net. So it was a really hard decision for me. And I jumped and put all my cards into me. Wow. Not, and you, that was a couple of years ago? No, this was last year. Last year. That's, uh, that's, 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 you know, like you said, because of, um, well, all right, so you, you, you took it all the bet on you and you're all in. Yeah, I'm all in and it hasn't been that long ago. It's only been last year that I did this. So, so I you kind of talk generally, starting to talk about a little bit about how the art and hustle idea, uh, uh, Dave, I, and you talked about going on, in on it together and he said, no, listen, this is you, you got to go out there and take the message. So you wanted to use social media as your your platform um, to, to get into what day-to-day um, -day people's stories are and how they're able to, you know, be the giant among us. And what what do you like about social media? It, it, has it helped you? Has it hurt you? Do you find it that it's more beneficial? Is it not? I know we're using the platform now, but yeah. I'm just curious, as you're, as you're all in, do you see this yeah. as a vehicle to take you to the next level? I totally think it takes me, it's going to help me take it to the next level because without social media, I would not have gotten all those mask orders without Facebook. Like all of my mask orders, a majority of them came from Facebook. And so had I not kept that door open and rapport and with everybody on social media, I would not be able to keep myself afloat because everyone still knew me on social media. Everyone's like, oh, you know, this and that. And I've everybody. always, I tried to treat everybody nice and treat everybody, how, you know. So that really helped me in the social media world with Facebook. And also social media, Instagram launched my, my art career as well as me, as Linda L. Chung. So at that point I had to decide if I was gonna go out as me or go out as like a cover name to hide behind. So because yeah, you said in previous interviews that you're an introvert, uh, yeah. you're not very, and obviously this is the total opposite of that. I mean, you're putting yourself yeah. out there. You're, yeah. You never interviewed people professionally before. You're putting, you're getting better and better at it. You're, you're putting your art totally out there, and, and anyone and any and could just post something, say something, yeah. and so you, you kind of just went in all in on on Linda. You know, so obviously yeah. that's a different mindset than the Linda that, you know, was working at the company that the Linda that was growing up in the yes. restaurant that. So, yes. um, so, you, you know, you definitely see the progression and the evolving of, mm -hmm. of you, you know, have become and will continue to progress towards. So that's, that's pretty awesome. I mean, I yeah, think thank uh, you. Thank in you. this day and age, you know, it's so easy to take the easy way, you know, yeah. uh, comfort yeah. for security, uh, whether it be in a job, whether it be in a marriage, whether it be in a, you know, 
anything, you know, fitness, you know, it's easy to just kind of take the easy way out and just say, Hey, I'm, you know, just chugging along. So, yeah. um, but it's scary. That's, that's really scary. When it, really, you, uh, it really is. And for me to put myself out there in social media is a hard thing because you're putting yourself completely out in the public for anybody to, uh, criticize and tell you that your art's a piece of shit and that's ugly or whatever. So I had to get really comfortable in my own skin and ready for an attack, you know, and it's the same thing as divorce. Like I had to be ready to fight. So yeah. unless I was ready to fight, I wouldn't have been able to put myself out there. So when I actually, the first step for me to find my, um, my own voice and skin was when I put my name out there on Instagram. It was like, okay, this is Linda L. Chung. This is my art. And this is what I stand for. If you don't like it, I'm actually okay with it because I didn't make the art for you. I made the art for myself. My art that I started creating was part of my mourning process of when my mom had passed away. So all that art was my mourning process. And I realized I stepped more into being an artist of more intuitive. And I was just doing it uh, how I felt, you know, the canvas was like my voice and it really became a part and extension of myself. Cause before I used to do art to make it look like something. I want to draw that tree. I want to draw that thing. I want to draw this picture. I was always making art to make it look like something else. So it wasn't for me or my voice or my feelings. So when she died was my rebirth. Wow. And, and either way, you were never going to be wrong because if you created the art from who you are and what you felt, yeah, and then a million people could critique it negatively. It doesn't matter. That's how you felt. And that's what it is. You're not yeah. looking for their, not exactly. looking for their satisfaction. You did it from exactly. the heart. So, exactly. Uh, what, so if you yeah, did it for motivations and created mm -hmm. it for a different way, for a different, you know, uh, commentary, then you'd probably give into that, but you just mm -hmm. put say, screw it. Here it is. And you like it. Great. If not, oh, well. Yeah, exactly. So that helped me get into the skin and be the person I am and find my voice to be able to okay with it. So from Instagram to Facebook and now through um, the next step is YouTube, which is Art and Hustle, that I'm using this as my next tool to be able to find a place within this uh, giant internet world. <laughs> Now, with, with my defense, I did try to download an Art and Hustle jig background. I did try to create... Oh, look, I even have like these... Uh, I don't even ask. I got these weird wigs <laughs> I was going to put on, you know, to, with the hat like, and know, everything. Uh -huh. to try to like, you know, uh, but you know, I figured, you know, you want to be authentic. I'm going to be authentic with my uh, uh, background and hair follicles. And, um, but you know, you should be very proud. What's one of the best compliments that you've gotten recently as an artist that you just inspires you to keep, you know, doing what you're doing? Um, I think it's the feedback that I'm getting from people like you and all of the friends and people who are supporting this, because I do you say like, like and I'm sorry to talk so people like me, but like, you know, the people that have been on your show, of course, you know, that you grew up with them, they grew up with you. And of course, you're going to, they're going to tell you, you know, nice things. I'm not, we don't say because we just want to say it, but do you ever have you ever got a nice compliment from someone that is yes. totally out of your world yes. where you just well, like, wow. Well, before I started these podcasts, I was doing, um, first I had done my own solo show in Gowanus, Brooklyn. After I did my own show in Gowanus, I started meeting all of these artists. And I felt like I also wanted to help them get their art and other people like me who didn't want to be, who didn't know how to get your art out there. Because really, if you're just starting out, you can't really get into these stuffy galleries. They're very inclusive and they're very, they're very like, well, your art's not good enough. Why you don't belong here. So I wanted a place where it was non-judgmental for everybody to be able to help people um, express themselves. So I allowed anybody who was doing art. I didn't, I didn't judge what kind of art you did, whatever kind of form you did from like music to art, to painting, to vending, whatever it was, I welcomed it into my art and hustle shows. So that also gave me the positive feedback because I was constantly getting um, people that I didn't know. So social media gave me all those people who were part of my show. I never talk like for me, I would just text people on DM. Hey, do you want to be part of the show? And that's how all of the people came about. So it was all through social media that I was able to get artists and musicians for my art hustle shows. You feel, you know, it seems like talking to you that you're not scared of anything anymore. Like it feels like, you you know, I, does anything, still, does anything frighten have, you anymore? I do. Like, you know, I do. I do have um, one more part of my psyche that I have to hurdle over, which is um, I think fully, I used to have this problem trusting men. 
So I used to always say, I can't trust men. Men are going to do this to me. They're going to whatever. I had this like issue. And then I realized eventually that I need to learn to trust myself. So I think that goes with childhood. Not being able to protect myself is that safetyness. So I think that that's the next step is to be able to trust myself and to be able to trust a partner as well. So that's my next evolution of me is to have like a healthy relationship. <laughs> that's the one thing that you always wanted, but you feel like you still don't have is that, yes. is that trust in men. Yes. And, and, you know, and obviously we know where that, that stems from. That's something that's, it's a life journey, you know, and all the stuff that we go through, it, mm -hmm. it tends to come out in different parts of our lives. You know, if yeah. it comes out at all, you know, some of us, yeah. we, we bury it so far in that um, we don't want to really even talk about it or deal with it. And uh, I think it's uh, phenomenal that you're tackling it head on. I mean, it just seems like you just, um, you know, just fearless, which is great. Even though, like you Hi. said, yeah, Hi. it's great. Um, what stayed the same though throughout your life so far? You know, like what has been a constant? You, you've talked about a lot of ups and downs, a lot of change, um, mm -hmm. you know, evolving. What has kept you, what, what, is, what has been pretty much stayed the same throughout your life? Um, um, a constant in my life that's always what stay the same about you maybe throughout it. about me yeah I, I i feel like i have this insatiable appetite to survive and to no matter what i'm gonna get through it so even though all of these things come at me i don't realize that it's a funny thing it was the podcast is that i don't I didn't never really saw myself until I started doing the podcast and editing them. So the person that I have created as a kid seems to be very strong, self-sufficient, and everyone sees me as a certain way, but I never saw myself like that until I started editing these podcasts and realizing, oh, wow, oh, you actually see yourself and you actually- and Like little little snippets, right? Little edits. Yeah. You know? And then I remember, cause you're saying that you never really liked your voice and I'd seen yourself on camera. Yeah. And that's, that's ironic cause you're, you know, you're an artist and you put, you're put you putting everything out there. So, yeah. so you're saying through this uh, editing process of this project, you've kind of got to see yourself a little bit and what's consistent yeah. throughout. Yeah, I actually see myself and I actually start liking myself more, which is funny because like, we're just really critical about ourselves and how we present ourselves to the world that you're so, um, I don't know, I don't know what the word is, but you're so like critical of seeing yourself on camera. So when I first started um, speaking and doing this, you just, you don't like anything. You don't like your voice. You don't like your hair. You don't like the light. You just think everything looks like garbage and you don't want to put it out there. But I actually pushed myself and I did my first podcast in my bedroom because that's where I was comfortable. All right, I'm back. Sorry about that. <laughs> So I was able to finally um, just push myself beyond my comfort zone. So I was super nervous. Um, I was sweating to death. I was so uncomfortable to be there to talk because I've always been taught to like kind of be the second hand person to support other people. So for me to put myself out there to talk was a really hard thing for me to do as well. And I'm getting more and more comfortable as I do more of these. So I'm starting to like myself on camera a little bit more. I'm starting to like what I say a little bit more. So, and stand up for myself or what I feel and believe. So it's been a beautiful journey. And I've noticed that a lot of the, you know, I always tell my students that, you know, what's the most fun part of a roller coaster? It's the, it's the scariest part, you know, and then, you know, most, and then obviously it's, the most exhilarating as well. So it sounds like every time that you hit the highest part, the scariest part, you just keep getting back on that roller coaster and, and, and yeah. keep going. Do you ever like, what do you, what do you do for fun? Like, is there things that you do for fun? It sounds like it's very uh, work driven. It's, and it's great, but is there things that you do to kind of let off some steam besides I, not, not listening to 80s? What do, what do I do? <laughs> what do I love? I mean, like, I love hanging out with my friends, having gatherings. I love cooking. I love, um, planning uh, trips with my kids or friends and um, having fun things to watch on Netflix or going out bowling. I mean, when we used to be able to go out, I like to go out bowling or- You're a bowler? I can't picture you. Yeah, really? Well, the, the funny thing bumpers is- Bumpers up my, or no bumpers up? I used to go to East Isaac Lanes all the time to go bowling because my brother was in a league. So every morning we would go to East Islip and bowl. <laughs> All right, so okay, so what? So how old are you at that point? Like, what are you? What are you? What are you in your teenage? We were years? little. We were little when we were going there because we were following him all the time when we were little to watch him bowl. All right, I'm gonna throw a couple things at you, and I want you to just give me like one or two word answers. Okay. okay? 
Okay. Uh, this this next topic is going to be about the aging process. Okay, about getting older. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to ask you what you remember. You just give me three or four words. All right, ready? 20s, go. What do you remember about your 20s? Give me some words from your 20s. Um, parties, drinking, hanging out. Okay, 30s. Um, 30s, family, kids, marriage. Okay, and what about a uh, little halfway, a little more than halfway in your 40s now? What are, what are you thinking? Uh, 40s is freedom. Okay, I like that. 40s is freedom. Any events that have happened over the past 10, 15 years that really stand out in your mind that are just like, you know, uh, this is a totally different life-changing situation and that really pivoted me in a different direction? Um, other, than, other than what we mentioned before today. Um, I, I, think, I think the main one is what we spoke about, which okay. was my mom passing away and that gave me my voice because she never had a voice. So when she died, she gave me the voice that she never had. So oh. I realized I didn't want to die unhappy. You know, it's, it's um, not to mention anything back to me, but, you know, my parent, you know, passed when I was very young and, uh, you know, I was six years old and my, my father passed. And it's, um, it's, it's interesting. Like, I don't know if I would be the same person that I'd be if he was still alive. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and yeah. Obviously, I'll never know. Uh, but the point is, is like, it's like, amazing. Do you remember how, when he passed away? When you were um, I remember he passed away on October 30th because we were about to go trick-or-treating the next day. And my mom kind of gathered us all into the room and she was just like, you know, uh, I just want to let you know that your dad, you know, passed. He got he got esophageal cancer, and then it oh. went right to his liver very quickly. And he kind of it was like a very quick thing. So they, oh. I just remember like uh, trick. That was a very sad Halloween. Oh my god, the Halloween but, was tough. Know, like, but like how you? That's not about me. I'm just saying like it, the losing a parent can really redirect you and focus yeah. you. Like, yeah. I, and I channeled it as, you know he's watching me. I want to make him proud. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, you know, I want to you know, be the, the best person. I, you know, it's stuff like that as you're getting yeah. through certain hurdles. Yeah. Um, so obviously that same situation uh, happened with you and, and your mom. And, and, you know, do you feel like, you know, getting older, do you feel like what's some of the more difficult things you're experiencing as you're getting older besides, uh, for me, it's like sitting in a chair every once in a while. It's just like, I just make a noise when I'm sitting in a chair. I'm like, I didn't do anything. I just sat down. I'm like, <sighs> like well, I just sat, you know, like, what are, how about you? Like anything as you're getting older, you're finding a little bit more difficult um, that maybe, uh, I, just, I feel like, I don't know if it's because of COVID, but I get tired really, really easily. Like if I, like, I can't do too many things on a weekend. Like if I do one or two things during a day, that's it. I'm done. I'm tired and I'm exhausted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think what's great about our age now is like, we like to go out earlier and, uh, and get home earlier. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, you know, yeah. one thing, like we're not going to be no. no, keep progressing to multiple things, you know, yeah, like, like this funny, like this, this past weekend, I actually took my kids out and we actually did three things one day. And I was wow. like, oh my God, guys, you know, that we just did way more than I'm actually usually capable of doing. Cause usually after one thing I'm done, I'm tired. I'm, I'm napping on the couch. That's what I love to do all the time is nap. And so, yeah, as I'm getting older, I just nap way too much. <laughs> I'm not a, I'm not a player. I just nap a lot. I That's just great. nap a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I now, love you, my nap. Obviously, you kind of, you've been living your life over the past four or five years, like kind of like just twisting and turning as it comes. Like where, where's Linda Chung 10 years from now at 56, at 66, 20 years? Oh my like, God. Where, That's where, crazy age. Like, That's a crazy age. I, I know. Just saying it out loud is, uh. And as I look at my beard through our, our interview and I see it getting grayer as we talk, um, it's crazy because your mind, my mom always says like aging is very humbling. You know, your mind, yes. you know, if you yes. look at it and you're like, you still feel for the most part, mm -hmm. you know, you think, mm -hmm. but then you look in the mirror, you're like, who the heck is well, this? Well, that's, that's what Schiavo says. Schiavo can't stand um, looking at himself for too long because he's always like, oh my God, I look so old. I look so old, you know, so he's always worried about that. So 56. Um, 56, 66, you know, like, you know, what are some things you're looking forward to as far as that down the I, road? You know? I am looking forward to peace and Zen and art and love, 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 what peace, love and art is what my main goals are. My, one of my main Zens these days is gardening. Really? So I would really love to expand my garden and make it more Zen and have more passive income because the Airbnb has given me the freedom to be able to do my art more now. So I can do freelance work at home, be at home with my kids. Because before 
I would never, I would spend like what, two hours with my kids when I would come home like seven, eight o'clock at night and then they go to bed at nine or 10. Like yeah. the quality of life was horrible before. So I'm so thankful that I can be home with my kids now and be able to freelance at home, do the passive income with the Airbnb. I'm my own cleaning lady. So I clean the Airbnb myself and I'm just happy that I can be there as the kids are getting older because before you know it, they're going to be in college. Yeah. Is there anything in your life taking place that you've like, that you've thrown out, so to speak, you know, um, that you wish you didn't throw out? Like, you know, maybe there was something in your life that you kind of let go and you maybe wish you didn't let go or do you have any regrets about certain things in your life that have taken um, place? I mean, if I have things that I've learned as I realized as I got older, like I feel like when I was in, when I was younger, I wasn't really good at juggling friends in different groups of friends. So Wait, I realized- when you, How old? Because in, in junior high and high school you did. But I feel like there was there was some parts of those years that I was making new friends and I feel like I probably neglected some old ones. So I did, didn't juggle that as well as I thought I should have. So that's like a definitely a learning experience that I always tell my kids, like, make sure you try to include everybody. Yes. You know? Yeah. So even as you have like old friends and new friends, make sure you don't forget your old friends. Cause I feel like, I think I did that a little bit. I forgot about some and I didn't know how to include everybody into as I was growing up. So that's one thing I feel like I've done a better job at as I got older. I feel like as you guys, as we get older, I feel like uh, our friends are, um, they come in and out a lot more and you actually try to hold on to the ones that have been with you, but you also, you have to let go of stuff too. It's like, it's like, it's like a weird revolving door. Like you, yeah. you, know, you got so much going on. All our lives are so busy. We have families, we have jobs, we have, you know, we just want time sometimes for ourselves. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's just hard you, you know, to, to juggle everything. And sometimes, you know, it just may not be the right season or right time for that person. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. you know, we have to learn not to be so hard on ourselves either. And decide like, you know, what you're doing, I feel, is by these podcasts and just by, you know, and I know we work together with other people trying to get the reunions to go and stuff like that. But what you're mm -hmm. doing is creating this bridge, tremendous bridge vehicle of like catching up with all these people, all mm -hmm. these great things. And I was, you know, watching a bunch of these over the past couple of weeks. And I'm just like, so proud of our group, Class. you know, I, was, I was like, and all that we've accomplished, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and continue to accomplish and, uh, and to sharing this. Uh, and, and you're the pioneer that's putting this out there for all of us to listen to, because I, I know Josh and I, you know, I didn't know, I know Rick here and there and Gary and, and, and Mr. Schiavo here and there and all these different people you're putting on Sunrise Scott, who I haven't seen since like God knows. And you're yeah. just getting deep into their experiences, life. adult life that we were never exposed to. Yes. And, you know, you're hearing what they held on to, what they could have let go. And, and it's, it's, we're, we're, we have a lot more in common than, uh, than I think we, you know, give ourselves credit for. Yeah, and I, it was beautiful to have these conversations with people because you would learn things that you would never know, you know, or you forgot, like me, like I forgot a lot of things, but I also didn't realize some things of what they're doing now and what they wanted to do and their hopes and dreams and aspirations. So I think it's beautiful. And Dave, Dave had this vision and Dave was always like, you should do this podcast because you are the bridge between all these people and not just people we know. I was also the bridge to- yeah collected all these people on Instagram to do those art and hustle shows. So it's translated beautifully to the podcast now since we, since COVID. So COVID happened and I had to pivot and decide, okay, I guess I'm just going to do it zoom format because that's what everyone's doing it and not get too worried about how to do the videos. I'm like, just, let's just do zoom because that's what everyone's comfortable. And we'll just great. And it's phenomenal that, that people put, you know, there's people in your life at certain times, certain reasons, you know, Dave coming yeah. into your life, bringing this all out in you, you know what I mean? And then, you know, giving you this idea and, and then next thing you know, it could lead to something else. So it's, I'm a big believer in that. Yeah. Um, now I'm around young people a lot as far as my job, obviously, but if you had to talk to a 16 year old, if you're giving some advice about living, if uh, the young person asks what's the most important thing, mm -hmm. You know, what was some, what would be some tidbits of, uh, that you took? Well, on? yes, now that I'm 46, I have many gems of advice for <laughs> 16 years of old people. Um, one of the main things I really also tell my kids. Hold on, let me sit down first before yeah. I start. <laughs> Not well, one, stand for long. Yeah. Well, one of the main, main, um, things I always realize now at 46 is like, you know what? whatever your dreams and aspirations of whatever you wanted to do as a kid that you love to do as a kid and always wanted to do, 
you have to follow that passion and follow it full force because if you ignore it, it's eventually going to come back around and tell you, listen, you've ignored me. Like, I really want to do this. Like, I really, I never tried it. I was scared to do it, but I think I want to do it. So those dreams and aspirations you had as a kid will always come around. So I would give anybody who's 16 years old now to just do it and do it either as your full hustle, side hustle, have plan A, B, and C and start a business because really um, one of the advices that I saw online was like real estate, stocks, um, and start a business. Those would be my main three advices for people because those will give you the freedom to be able to do more things, make more money, have a better quality of life. Because working a regular nine to five corporate world, you are working for somebody else and you're just chasing um you're chasing the corporate America, which really doesn't care about you, unfortunately, because they you're just a number to them and they're you're expendable. So I, I stay with my company for a really long time thinking that, oh, OK, well, they're a huge company. And eventually when they're done, I'll get a severance package and I'll be OK. No, they went bankrupt. So I didn't get my severance. But you were raised in that environment, as we talked about earlier, about, you know, immigrant family, work yeah, hard, like make, make money, money make, make money, make money. And believe it or not, through our story today, you can see how you've totally evolved and spun from that. Yeah. And the advice that you're trying to share is like a side hustle might actually become the, your, the hustle. Your main hustle. Your, like, your main really, hustle, like, right. yeah, like the main thing I've always wanted to do as a kid was just to do art. Like, even when I remember specifically someone asking me what I want to do in Syracuse, I said, I just want to do art. And that's literally what I say all the time now on my podcast is, what do I want to do? I just want to do art. But the other thing I'm finding is that I love stories. And through everyone's stories and through my stories, it's been a healing process. So I feel like one story will heal another. And I see art in everything, you know? So art and hustle is the art of living now. That's great. And, and you know, it's interesting as, a, as you being an artist, like you get to put in what you feel and what's going on in your life into some kind of productive work where the average, you know, non-artistic person like myself, if somebody asks, oh, well, Jordan, how are you doing? What have you been up to? Oh, I'm doing okay working, you know, the wife, kids, you know, they, but like I'm not really showing or saying truly how I'm doing because no, A, I don't think anybody really wants to hear it. And two, there's no, you know, there's really no channel out of, of that energy except through work, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Where you get to put mm -hmm. it into art Mm -hmm. and get everybody to see it they get to yeah. interpret it in different levels of what you might have been feeling at that time yeah but whatever but everyone has a story so jordan i feel like you definitely have a story because everybody has gone through something everyone's life is part of their journey journey that will help somebody else too and your your outlet is your passion to be a teacher and helping students and your real estate and helping someone find that perfect home so that is that your passion could be helping people, you know, like that's a beautiful thing as well. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting how God life just puts you on different targets. Like I said, I think because of uh, my dad passing at a young age, I think I think I was kind of subconsciously put into a role of maybe being a positive male figure for those that didn't. Because I grew up with people that some had dads, some didn't, but we all kind of had to form the brotherhood, similar to other stories that other gentlemen were saying how. Yeah they form this tight bond with their friends. And, and I know you said you were a little bit scattered with your friends, but it's just interesting how like when life throws you things, how you can respond to it and how you can turn that into your story and hopefully into a positive way. It's not yeah. always positive, but yeah, um, you do the best that you can. And what are the- This is about you today, Linda. It's about Linda showing you how much this was fun. I, I, first of all, I was looking forward to this. I, you know, I know we talked about in the past about maybe me hopping on and doing it. I was like, ah, I don't really know. Cause like, I, I just felt like I wanted to, you know, I loved hearing other people's stories, but I wasn't ready yet to share yeah. mine. And I, and, and I might eventually, but I wanted to focus, turn the camera around onto you and the story around onto you because, you know, you have such amazing things to tell people. And um, I know you shared a little bit through your interviews, but I hope I covered the bases. Are there anything that, is there anything I might've left out? You might want to um, add. Like, I mean, you know, my, la uh, my last word of advice for anybody also is to cherish your friendships because I feel like friendships also are very important to have a well-rounded um, life and experience because we all need to lean on somebody. And I think that friendships are very important and you have to keep nurturing them. Otherwise they're not going to be around when you need them and you get older. So 
And it's always good to have like different points of view from your friends and coworkers or whoever. So um, definitely cherish those. So I thank you for flipping the tables for yeah, me. And no problem. This, me. this was fun. I, I, this reminds me a little bit of back in my uh, college days. I had a, I had a radio station that I was a, uh, well, I see, to, I didn't I know that about people. you, Jordan. So see this, I'm, I'm learning well, new things. <laughs> it was, uh, we had about probably 12 listeners, so it was great. But uh, it was, uh, <laughs> uh, it was a good experience. But Linda, we love you. I love you. You know, you do an amazing you. job. Please keep it up. And, uh, you know, hopefully one day we'll, uh, we'll see each other soon. We're, and I, We're going to, we're going to turn the table soon now, whenever you're ready, we're going to, okay. uh, thank you so much for taking the time and interviewing me and have a great day. You too, Linda. Thank you so much. Be well. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Finally getting back to me, you know, my art. All I want to do is art. And the other thing is that I love stories. So like to me, art is in everything. You. Your art is your voice, your speaking, your connection. You know, you can, you can feel everyone's energy. That's your art. It's the art of living to me. So art and hustle to me is the art of living and art of it and everything. Uh, I hope that you've cut that piece right there and make it your intro and your outro because that was dope.